Welcome everyone to this edition of the CSIA Partner Technical Webinar Series. My name is Tony Verovin and I am the CSIA Membership and Marketing Manager. I'm happy to introduce our partners and webinar hosts from Clayton and McCurvey and Miller Prost. CSIA is pleased to co-sponsor this educational webinar with our partner members and valued industry proponents. For those of you who are unfamiliar with CSIA, we are the only trade association focused on advancing the system integration industry. Our vision is to ensure that manufacturing and process industries everywhere have access to low risk, safe, and successful application of automation technology. To accomplish this, CSIA supports system integrator companies in becoming better businesses. We offer guidance to improve integrator effectiveness with our best practices and benchmarks manual, an open forum to network and learn from other companies, and opportunities to market within the industry. As our members continue to improve their management skills, they can begin to work toward becoming CSIA certified, an industry standard in SI business excellence. CSIA membership offers members access to resources needed to attain its business goals. These benefits include networking opportunities at the annual executive conference, marketing toolkits, educational materials, and the industrial automation exchange, an online buyer's guide and community that connects end user clients with system integrators and industry suppliers. Clients in all industries are now seeking integrators with a CSIA certification alongside and sometimes instead of ISO. They recognize certified integrators commitment to industry standards and business acumen. As a result, being certified can shorten the sales cycle. It also means the supplier's technology is well represented and greatly reduces the risk of project failure. Certified system integrators generally run better businesses. CSIA Industrial Automation Exchange is the premier automation guide featuring system integrators and suppliers who provide industrial, manufacturing, and process automation solutions. For integrators and suppliers, it's a place to market their expertise. Clients will find white papers, case studies, capabilities, contact information, and can engage in conversation directly with CSIA members. We just launched the industrial Talking Industrial Automation podcast where you get to know the people that make modern manufacturing and processing possible. Visit TalkingIndustrialAutomation.com to listen and subscribe. Visit ControlSys.org for more information. Adam Herman of Miller Prost and Sarah Russell of Clayton and McCurvey are our presenters today. Adam serves as the Chief Visionary Officer for Miller Prost. He has more than 25 years of experience serving the special needs of businesses and their owners. He provides consulting and support services in the areas of business valuation, litigation services, merger and acquisition services, research and experimentation, tax credit services, and business operational analysis. Sarah Russell is an owner and point person for international tax strategies at Clayton and McCurvey. She helps owners and executive teams with international tax consulting and compliance, looking for big picture solutions to advise clients on global operational structuring, foreign tax utilization, and tax treaty analysis. She also co-leads the firm's system integrators leadership, providing tax strategies and solutions. Thanks for hosting this webinar. Take it away, Sarah and Adam. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, I'll add that Clayton Kirby and Mueller Prost have been working together for about 15 years um, providing research and experimentation credit services to clients within this industry. Uh, the rules surrounding that credit haven't changed with tax reform, so we won't be talking about that today. And instead, we'll focus on some big areas we think are important to the system integration industry. Um, we also spent some time talking to different members of CSIA at the San Francisco event a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to do our best to address some of the questions we heard throughout the week. 
With that being said, we have a lot of material to cover, so this will be what I call a drive-by version of tax reform. <laughs> we have included some individual slides at the back of the presentation, but in the interest of time, we're not going to go over those today, but they'll be available for your reference, and certainly if you have any questions on anything, feel free to reach out to Adam and I, and we'll be happy to help you. Uh, so some things that we'll cover today, what to expect and when to expect it, some common misconceptions we've heard out there as it relates to tax reform, um, some potential opportunities, some potential landmines, and then we'll go through the business tax provisions. I'm going to cover the pass-through entity provisions that I think are really important. Uh, Adam is going to cover the general corporate provisions, and then as I mentioned, the international tax provisions are included um, in this packet, but we are not going to cover them. So what to expect and when to expect it. Only a few provisions apply to the 2017 tax year. Uh, most apply to 2018 and forward. The biggest items that applied in 2017 were bonus depreciation as well as um, an international provision for tax um, repatriation tax. If you have a foreign subsidiary, you may have had an additional tax due that you hadn't um, had in the past. The business and international provisions are largely permanent, although there is some phase in and phase out in those provisions, but largely and in general, those provisions are permanent. On the other hand, individual provisions are largely temporary, and they cover typically years 2018 through 2025. The IRS has set priority guidance, which includes initial implementation of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, the biggest item that I see for their focus, which we're hoping to get guidance on this summer, is as it relates to the pass-through deduction, which we'll cover in a few slides. So some common misconceptions that I've heard um, as it relates to tax reform is due to the decreased tax rate, I should switch my S-Corp or LLC to a C-Corporation. Um, I think that's a gut reaction because the C-Corp rate re was reduced so low. However, uh, that really takes a little bit more analysis on, on, on the taxpayer's part. We have used software to help model the tax under both structures. And when we've done that, we've seen that the tax rates are um, still a little bit lower, or if you get the pass-through deduction, um, more than a little bit lower in the S-Corp structure than it is in the C-Corp structure or the uh, S-Corp or LLC structure. And, and so it really might come down to other uh, non-tax considerations when you're thinking about that. And we're more than happy to work with you to run through the models and discuss some of those items to consider. But really the big items to consider is, are you, are you planning on selling your company anytime soon? Typically if you are, it's better to be a, a flow-through entity than a C-Corp because the C-Corp you'll end up paying a little bit more tax on, on an exit. And then what you're doing with your cash. If you're reinvesting uh, indefinitely into, into your company, then you may be able to defer some tax in a C-Corp structure instead. But those are really uh, more business decisions when you're looking at your entity structure and not really tax-driven. Uh, other misconceptions we already talked about. Some changes were effective in 2017. Most people I talked to thought everything wasn't applicable until 2018. So keeping that in mind, that there may be some things you could take advantage of in 2017, especially as it relates to bonus depreciation. Uh, I heard, and I think that this uh, misconception has started to resolve itself as we've gotten more into the months into tax reform now, but it, in the beginning I heard a lot that the r and &E credits will no longer be available or that the computations have changed, and that's just not true. And another common misconception is that everyone will see a decrease in their tax rate. Um, this is more uh, applicable to non-business owners, but are high-income, uh, wealthy people. I have seen, depending on what state they live in, that they may actually see a slight increase in their effective tax rate. The lower tax rate equals more cash for investment in your business. Um, so you may have an opportunity to uh, use the savings on taxes to help grow your business. Um, if you're a C-Corp structure, the export sales of goods or services may be eligible for a special deduction. There's immediate expensing for capital expenditures available now. 
And companies with revenue of less than $25 million of gross receipts should review accounting methods that weren't previously available. And Adam will talk about that a little bit in more detail later on. Um, so some potential landmines to be aware of. We are still waiting on clarification guidance from the IRS on many different issues, which makes tax planning very, very difficult. Um, there, there's a new rule that's out there, the sale of self-created property is not treated as a capital asset, which results in ordinary income. This is an important issue, especially if you're thinking about a transaction, because it should impact the way M&A transactions and deals are structured in 2018 and beyond. Um, you want to make sure to protect as much capital gain treatment on a sale of a business as possible. Um, we already talked, some taxpayers could actually see their tax liability increase even though the marginal tax rates have decreased. And this is really due to the loss of certain deductions. The biggest one is the state and local tax deduction is now limited to $10,000. And for those companies that are doing business internationally, and that, that's not just, that's more than an export of sales or goods. It's really if you have a foreign subsidiary or you're a foreign owned company, the international regulations have become far more complex and there are some pretty big unintended consequences in there, I think. So we'll talk about the pass-through deduction that's available out there. And I got a lot of questions on this um, when, it, when we were in San Francisco. The unfortunate answer for some of those questions is that we are still waiting on guidance from the IRS. Um, but we'll do our best to sort of walk you through it and give you our opinion. So a lot of people know that beginning in 2018, there is a 20% deduction that is applicable to taxpayers, what they call qualified business income. That qualified business income is domestic business income. So if you were to have a, um, a, a company that had a foreign subsidiary that was treated as a disregarded entity, um, the, the income flowing from that disregarded entity would not be qualified business income. It also doesn't include items such as interest, dividends, short-term or long-term capital gains, commodity gains, foreign currency gains. Uh, most of my clients, the issue on this area is that if they've set up uh, what's called an IC disc to uh, get a lower effective tax rate on export sales, the dividends from that IC disc won't be considered qualified business income. So you won't get an additional deduction on that income. And the deduction applies to pass-through entities. So sole proprietorships, partnerships, LLCs, S-Corps, et cetera. The pass-through tax treatment is uh, limited to 20% of qualified business income or the greater of 50% of W-2 wages paid with respect to the qualified business or the sum of 25% of W-2 wages plus 2.5% of the unadjusted basis of all qualified property. That second limitation is really uh, more for real estate companies, so we're not going to we're not going to talk too much about that. Uh, the the business must be qualified to take the deduction, so their specified service companies will not qualify. Um, there is a de minimis income threshold for service companies where they where you would still be allowed to take the deduction, and that is income that does not exceed three hundred fifteen thousand dollars if you're married filing joint, or $157,500 for single filers. Specified service companies, and this is the area that I think is causing a lot of heartburn for, for companies, includes services in the fields of health, law, accounting, consulting, financial services, brokerage services. But engineering and architecture services are specifically excluded from being classified as a specified service company. Uh, I, there's, there's ambiguity in this law because there is a clause in the law that says that if your business is dependent upon the reputation or skill of an owner or employee, then you could potentially be uh, considered a specified service company. I will say that the committee reports uh, included in the legislation that were passed, which includes Senate discussions, uh, indicate that the intent is that this uh, this pass-through deduction will be treated similar to the old domestic production activity deduction 
And it will also follow some regulations that exist for professional service corporations, which it has a tremendous amount of case law. And so when you look at the case law, uh, it's mostly focused on consulting, which I think is the most ambiguous uh, specified service field that's listed in the, in the um, legislation. And, and so we have been, you know, not, not completely relying on that at this point, but sort of predicting which way the IRS is going to issue final regulations on this law when determining whether or not the business is qualified. Um, we're at least allowed to say, hey, we, we believe this is the direction that the IRS is going to go based on this case law and based on the committee report, but we're not certain yet. So some pending questions to the IRS on this treatment is, um, you know, I mentioned that the committee reports refer to other sections of the code. It's code section 448. Um, it indicates business is dependent upon the reputation of one or more of its employees. We don't know how the IRS is going to interpret this language. Many comments have been issued from practitioners to the IRS asking about this. Um, the netting of qualified business income and loss for taxpayers with multiple trades or business is unclear. Um, if you have a tiered entity structure, it's unclear. And the biggest one is if you are using a PEO, do you get the benefit of those W-2 wages for purposes of that uh, limitation on the deduction? Uh, there's an example in here. I'm not going to go through it in the interest of time, but you can sort of read through it and see that um, how the deduction will work and potentially read what your potential uh, tax savings would be. The other big item in a pass-through entity that I don't feel like has gotten much publicity is the excess business loss rule. I'm not going to go through all the definitions, but essentially what this rule states is that if you incur a loss as an S Corp or an LLC, uh, you are only allowed to deduct $500,000 of that loss against other income, which would be wages, investment income, any other income that you had coming through your tax return. Only $500,000 of that loss will be able to be deducted in the current year. The remaining loss available, so if you had a million dollar loss, you would be able to deduct $500,000 and you would have a $500,000 loss carry forward that you would be able to apply in the future years. So you wouldn't lose it all, but it gets treated as a carry forward. In the past, you could have a million dollar loss in your business. And if you had a million dollars of investment income, you would still pay zero tax. So this is a big, um, a big area that I think a lot of people are not familiar with um, to be aware of. Because if you're, if you're losing a lot of money in your business and you think you're going to be able to offset all of your taxable income and you don't pay any estimated tax payments, you could be uh, underpaid for the year. So be aware of that excess business loss rule. With that, I will let Adam take it over with the general business provision. Great. Um, thanks, Sarah. Tony, uh, could you please advance it, if you can, to the general business provision slide? Yes. And let's go to the next one. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for the patience um, um, going through this. and. Um, Anyway, it's uh, President Trump signed on December 22nd, 2017, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, you know, these changes are broad and it, and it really affects all different types of businesses and, and individuals. So at first, everyone's pretty excited about that the C Corp rate has, has gone down to 21% effective for tax years beginning in 2018. But it doesn't mean that you automatically should switch to being a C corporation. You know, as Sarah mentioned, a detailed tax analysis would be needed to, uh, to be put together to see if it would be beneficial to switch to a C-Corp. This change to a C-Corp may be very beneficial for a company in the growth mode. Uh, next slide, please. For those companies that have previously paid in the alternative minimum tax, this alternative minimum tax has now been repealed. And this is for companies, not for individuals. So we have a, a chart here of companies that have uh, had AMT, uh, what you need to do about the credit carry forwards. So uh, for the years 2018 through 2020, you can offset up to 50%. Um, and then you can read through the following chart there if you happen to um, be, uh, have previously paid in AMT. Uh, next slide, please. 
bonus depreciation. Mainly, uh, what Congress did here is that they want to incentivize companies to make more capital expenditures to get the economy really rocking and rolling. So the bonus depreciation amount increased from 50% to 100%, which is very significant. And it's also applicable to property that's been placed in service after September 27th of 2017. What, what also is very nice about this change is that bonus depreciation is available for purchases of used property. It doesn't have to be new property anymore. So if it's new to you, it does count for bonus depreciation purposes. Overall, you make a class life uh, election. This election is generally irrevocable. However, there is a, a six month grace period if you do need to amend, if there's an actual change in your tax planning in doing so. So this has been a very nice addition in the tax law. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, section 179. Uh, this is also another incentive to try to depreciate, to try to reduce your taxable income. The Section 179 maximum expensing deduction increased to $1 million. There is a, the limit will be reduced if total assets in place in service exceed $2.5 million, and that is dollar for dollar. Uh, this is a permanent increase in the amount of Section 179 expenditure. And what's important to note is that this is an asset by asset uh, election rather than a class election. So really what you have to figure out here when we're talking about bonus and section 179 is how much depreciation do you want to take and when do you want to take it? And, and there's a, we'll, we'll get into some of the other factors here with the tax law. You have to take a look at all of these factors and we'll get into interest deduction and so forth of trying to plan out uh, when you want to take the depreciation, and that's really what it's all about. Uh, the next slide deals with uh, raising the caps on depreciation. So there is a theme here with the, the tax code, and that's spend, spend, spend. And here are the incentives for spending. Uh, you have, um, it, it really has gone up quite a bit, uh, the, the caps. You can see in the first year alone, that uh, with using some bonus depreciation, the cap is at $18,000. The luxury auto continues to not include vehicles with a gross weight of over uh, 6,000 pounds. And if you need a, a listing of what vehicles would qualify or not qualify, uh, please feel free to, uh, to contact uh, Sarah or I, and we can provide you with some information on the, uh, more specific information on the luxury autos. The next slide. Uh, the Domestic Production Activities Deduction, DPAD, uh, this has now been repealed. Uh, so, how, however, you know, as Sarah discussed, the new tax law does provide a more robust 20% uh, pass-through deduction uh, and, of course, the lower tax rate. Uh, so, this, uh, this will no longer uh, be in the tax code or on returns uh, going forward. So, that's important to note. Uh, let's go through the next slide, which is a, an example of a C corporation. Here we have a, a company that's making $1.5 million a taxable income before depreciation, and of course, the, the DPAD. They're making a million dollars capital expenditure investment. 100% um, of the income is qualified production income. We're going to look at the new interest deduction limitation. and. Taxpayer is not subject to AMT. So let's get right to the example, uh, which is on the next slide. Here you have, uh, it, it looks definitely simpler. You have the 1.5 when comparing 2017 taxes to 2018 taxes. Uh, we just discussed that the bonus depreciation went up to 100%. So that uh, comes right off the bat. You're, $500,000 better. You don't have to deal with the maker's depreciation because you're already taking all of the assets and depreciating those. Uh, as I just mentioned, the DPAD is now gone. Uh, it doesn't exist in 2018. So your taxable income uh, for comparison purposes has dropped. You know, it's from $722,150 to a half a million dollars. Now also what has happened 
uh, is that that tax of $252,752 for 2017, that was taxed at 35%. Now we get to uh, enjoy the 21% uh, C Corp uh, rate, uh, so the tax is $105,000. So if you take a look at the uh, percentage of the effective tax rate, what that's uh, doing is uh, that's taking your tax over your income limit, and you can see that it's the taxes overall have gone down uh, substantially for C corporations. Okay, the next slide uh, has some other favorable changes, uh, which are very welcome changes. Uh, it's in, uh, in methods of accounting. Uh, the new legislation increases the average gross receipts limitation to 25 million. That's up from 10 million, and it will be adjusted for inflation. So why is this terrific? Well, if you take a look at the the cash method, is overall, as we know, easier than the accrual method, and it provides you know really much more simplicity and a better match of cash flows to to tax liabilities. So you can even use this method if you have inventory. So an example, uh, if you are in a high growth mode, you're not gonna pay tax on accounts receivable until it's received. So once again, some tax planning should you be on the cash method if you are under $25 million. Uh, there's also been a, a, a changes in inventory and then one thing that we do like here is that with the IRC section 263A, you know, that, that's always been a complicated calculation and you no longer have to do this, you know, once again, if you're under that 25 million. So that's a welcome change also. Now with uh, the next one is with long-term contracts with the changes in, in um, accounting, uh, that has to deal with, and that's of course long-term is over 12 months. Uh, you're generally required to use the, the percentage of completion. However, now you can use a completed uh, contract method So when revenue is recognized. So that might be a little bit more advantageous uh, to take a look at uh, those long-term contracts with this change in the method of accounting. The next slide is dealing with the business interest um, expense limitation. Now, for any companies that are on the call that happen to be uh, owned by a private equity company or a highly leveraged company, you might want to pay close attention to this change in the tax law. So taxpayers with gross receipts in excess of $25 million face these, this possible limitation. So there's interest in excess of 30% of the adjusted taxable income will not be deductible. However, any amounts disallowed may be carried forward indefinitely. So that's something you, you want to take a look at. Now there are some unresolved questions, you know, as Sarah mentioned up front, that you know, we're waiting for IRS guidance. Uh, this area ha it really needs to be cleared up a little bit, but overall that is the intent is to, um, is to not allow some of the interest if it's in excess of 30% of adjusted taxable income. Okay, the next slide uh, really deals more with uh, special rules for real estate businesses. So the real estate business uh, cannot, can, elect, can elect not to apply this limitation. So we're not gonna get into this too much on this call, but we just wanted to let you know that there was uh, special rules for real estate business, businesses. Okay, let's go to the slide on the next slide on NOLs. This is a very uh, another very important slide and note that net operating losses arriving in tax years beginning after 2017 will be limited to 80% of taxable income. So NOLs ari uh, arising in years. Uh, ending after December 31st, 2017 will no longer be available for the uh, carryback of the two years, but you can carry forward indefinitely. Uh, now there's, for any companies that are on the call that happen to be a fiscal year end, uh, for instance, let's say it was a March 31st, uh, 2018, you, you cannot carry back the, the NOL for the two years but you are subject to the 80% limitation. 
So this is something to pay very uh, close attention to if you happen to have uh, any NOLs um, or, or planning for that. Uh, you want to make sure you know the, the new rules and how that does apply. Uh, Next slide. I, yeah, yeah, go practice. ahead. Um, sure. I just wanted to mention the, the strange rule that exists here is that if you have a pool of NOLs that existed before 2017, it appears, unless the IRS issues some correct, corrective legislation, that you will be able to utilize those NOLs 100% to offset taxable income 100% until those are used up. So in the past, when you used an NOL, you would usually pay alternative minimum tax, but since AMT has been repealed, you could be in a situation where you're not paying any tax until you have your NOL pool that existed prior to the enactment of this legislation utilized. Okay, great, thanks, Sarah. All right, the next slide is on meal expense, and, and this, uh, the next couple of slides Call, uh, usually cause some heartburn, and these are the questions that Sarah and I normally get at cocktail hours. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, if you're providing internally for your employees uh, lunches, snacks, so forth, which is very popular before you were able to deduct 100% of that expenditure, now it's it's 50%. So um, that's uh, a little bit of a change there. So a little bit less of a deduction. deduction. However, the government feels, well, we're giving you a lower tax rate for C-Corps and some of these other changes. There's some give and take there. But that question does come up quite a bit. Uh, the next slide has to deal with, it deals with entertainment. So we can let out a big boo here uh, because you're no longer able to uh, deduct if you take a client to a ball game or you go out for golf or some sort of amusement or recreational activity, uh, you, you can no longer uh, deduct these types of uh, expenses. So even if there is a substantial bona fide uh, you know, business discussion, entertainment, uh, this is no longer um, deductible. So this does come up quite a bit. It's uh, you know, a little bit disappointing on that, but it is what it is right now. Okay, the next slide deals with uh, the R&D. Uh, the R&D credit is still permanent in the tax code, and it still requires that there's very good due diligence with uh, the proper documentation and meeting the four-part test of Internal Revenue Code, uh, Section 41. Uh, so you, um, your industry is normally uh, an excellent candidate for this, um, this R&D credit. But they did make a slight change. So beginning in 2021, uh, these expenses are going to be capitalized and amortized over a five-year period. So what does that really mean for everyone on, on the call that's taking the credit? Starting in 2021, there's gonna be, it's, it's really more of a timing difference because you're going to be claiming the credit every year. Um, and it's you're going to then be in essence getting one-fifths, two-fifths, three-fifths, and it will work itself out to more of a timing difference, but the benefit uh, will still be there. So it's a slight change, and there is some talk that they might um, go back and, and make a change uh, to this, so we'll uh, keep everyone posted on that. Okay, the next slide here is, um, is a 2017 versus 2019. Uh, there's some factors of uh, the interplay on all this with interest expense that we just talked about, entertainment, meals, and so forth. So let's get right into the example. Um, you have the, uh, in, on the next slide here, you have the uh, entertainment add back. So that's no longer deductible. You have to add that back. You have to add back 50% of the meals expenses you were deducting. That's another $100,000. Uh, you have to add back the, the interest expense and then do a calculation of how much interest expense you could deduct because you have that 30% uh, amount of, um, of the adjustment there. So we go to the next slide and we take a look at the comparison on uh, the entertainment add back. 
you know, once again, uh, the, you have to add back that 100%, the meals. Uh, you get the bonus depreciation of 100% uh, rather than 50%. Uh, per the last slide, you have to add back that interest add back because you can't deduct all of your interest expense. And you come up with your pre-NOL taxable income of a little bit higher from 582 to 645. So you see that there's a lot of moving parts with the, the tax law, how you have to compute all of these various different categories uh, to see what you're really going to wind up with, which requires some you know, tax planning. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, uh, this uh, shows that uh, there's an adjustment with the NOL in 2017. You had 100 percent of that used. Uh, that you can use 100% of your NOL. In 2019, you can only use 80%. So that does result in uh, taxable income of 129000 for 2019, but you are at the lower tax rate of 21%, so your regular tax is $27,000. So I know we just went through um, a, a bunch of different things, but these these slides here serve as a, a very good summary of how everything will, all the changes in the tax will interplay with one another. I'm going to switch it now over to Sarah to cover some of the new international provisions. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Um, I just wanted to mention one thing on, on uh, a couple of the topics that Adam covered. There were several items it, as it relates to methods of accounting as well as this interest expense limitation that talked about a gross receipts limitation. When you're looking at whether or not you're, you're subject to those rules or if the change in accounting method rules are available to you, you do need to look at it on a controlled group basis. So if you have two companies that are commonly owned and combined, they have more than $25 million in gross receipts, then those changes of accounting method won't be available to you and you will be subject to this business interest limitation. Um, that being said, moving on to the international provisions. So these provisions are, are really just applicable um, to companies that are doing business internationally. Um, there's some new penalties out there for Form 5472. This is a form that's applicable to foreign-owned companies. They increase the penalty from $10,000 for failure to file to $25,000 for failure to file. Um, that's because there's a uh, of some of the new tax legislation that's out there. There's no change on, on the other forms that are out there uh, for if you own a foreign company. Uh, there's, if, you, if you own a foreign company, moving forward, if you have dividends coming up from that foreign company, those will no longer be subject to tax as long as you meet certain requirements. Uh, next slide. Uh, the big issue that I had a lot of my clients face this year was this mandatory repatriation. This was a tax on the accumulated earnings and profits of a foreign subsidiary um, that had not previously distributed the money up to the parent company. The tax can be paid over eight years, um, and it's, it's dependent upon what type of assets you hold in that company. If you have cash or liquid assets, the tax was going to be 15.5%. If they were not liquid assets, then the tax was only 8%. And this was due with 2017 tax return, but you could, have, you could make an election to pay it over time. There is a great amount of uncertainty, even though this tax was due on April 15th, on some of the calculations that go into this tax. The big area to highlight here is that right before the deadline, the IRS, the IRS issued some guidance that indicated if you had an overpayment of your regular tax, um, that overpayment would first be applied to the total repatriation tax liability before it is applied to your 2018 estimated tax payments. They gave no guidance on how to change that or how to make an election to make sure that your tax payment got applied to 2018. They did not allow for you to apply it only to your first payment of the total charge. Uh, we expect that to change, but as of today, that guidance is out there. And so we had companies, unfortunately, make an extra first quarter estimated tax payment for 2018, even though their overpayment would have covered it because of this transition tax. 
So if you're not aware of that rule and you, and you have any concerns, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm more than happy to walk you through it. Um, so the other big, um, we're going to skip some of these slides here. The other big item that I wanted to point out is there is now a deduction for C corporations only. It's called the Foreign Derived Intangible Income Deduction. And it sounds like it's only applicable for companies that have intangible assets, but it's really, it's really not. It's a, it's, a, it's a mathematical calculation, and if you earn income from export sales of goods or services, you could potentially reduce your tax rate on that income to 13.125% through 2025. It goes up a little bit after that to 16406 Again, it's the mathematics of how, how this calculation works. But be aware that there, if you are a C corporation and you are exporting any of your goods or services, this deduction is available for you out there and you should definitely be taking advantage of it. There is certainly some um, question in the world tax, uh, the World Trade Organization, whether or not this deduction will um, be upheld uh, for the long term but I don't anticipate anything would change in the very near term. Um, for those of you that have been doing business internationally for several years, there used to be a deduction called the extraterritorial income exclusion, which they changed because they, the United States got a lot of pushback on that deduction. I anticipate this will, something similar will happen to this deduction, but that stuff usually takes a bit of time. Um, the other big item to be uh, aware of if you own a foreign subsidiary that's that's taxed as a controlled foreign corporation, there is a new international tax provision. Uh, we call it GILTI. It's the Global Intangible Low Tax Income. It, you potentially have uh, an additional tax that you will end up paying. And again, uh, they have intangible low tax income in in the uh, the title of this provision but it has nothing to do with intangible assets. So it's just something to be aware of if you have a controlled foreign corporation that's making money, uh, you, it is likely that you could be subject to this tax. And you definitely need through the calculation. Um, I initially at first glance thought, oh, this won't apply to most of my clients because most of my clients are set up controlled foreign corporations with manufacturing operations and aren't really uh, generating intangible income. And then as I got into the details of the law, I realized it doesn't really matter. Um, so be aware of that. I'm not going to go through the details of that. I just really wanted to point it out so that everybody was aware. And if you have questions or want more information, I'm happy to provide it. Uh, those were the main topics that I wanted to go through in the international um, tax provisions that were covered in tax reform. Really, you know, to summarize, the tax reform, they kept saying that tax reform was going to simplify the tax code, but it really did anything but make things simpler. Um, there, there certainly is a pocket of individuals who uh, their tax returns will be simpler, but as a business owner, the, the tax law really didn't make anything simpler. Um, there's still a lot of unknowns included in the business provisions, which continues to make planning difficult. I get questions every day from my clients asking me what to do about different things and Unfortunately, the answer is still a best guess. You know, my best guess is this, but I don't know and I can't tell you for sure. And that's not a position any business owner likes to be in. Um, if you're doing business internationally, I can't stress enough how important it is to understand how these new international provisions will impact your company. Um, with that being said, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us. If you have any questions, um, we've got some time to take some questions. Sarah, you might want to make mention too about the international about the individual provisions, the, uh, the slides that were included here. This. Yeah, I mentioned that at the top. Okay, Sarah and Adam, um, we obviously apologize for uh, the Murphy's Law that, of course, uh, jumped in here at the beginning. <laughs> uh, but of course, you do have your slides, and with your permission, I will convert them to PDF and uh, make those available. Perfect. Please do so. Okay, everybody, uh, uh, expect by the end of the day that I will uh, PDF those and then send those to you guys directly. Okay.
I assume there's no if questions. There's any questions, go ahead and use the questions here. I don't see any other questions uh, coming okay. through yet. Okay. Well, like Adam and I said, we're more than happy to answer any questions as you process some of the information that we went through. I know it was a lot. Um, like I said, it's our, our drive-by tax reform training session. Um, it's really just meant to give you uh, an overview so you, you maybe know what you don't know and need to look into a little bit more. Anything, anything specific about LLCs? Um, not specifically about LLCs, but as an LLC, you are treated, you are, um, you know, you do have that new pass-through deduction available to you if, you're, if your business is qualified for it. Um, and you will also be subject to that business loss limitation that's out there of $500,000 in the event that you have a loss year. And that's an important, important factor because, you know, with the new bonus depreciations, a lot of my clients are potentially... Um, going to have a taxable loss in 2018, depending on their capital investment. And keeping that in mind, that that bonus depreciation will no longer help you offset other income you may have running through your return. So making sure you're taking advantage of that pass-through deduction, but then also being cognizant of that, uh, that business loss limitation. Tony, do you see what the, it looks like there's a question. Do you see what it is? Yep, it says clarify the engineers and architects exemption and how CSIA applies. <laughs> um, I I wish I could. So in in the regulations, the uh, the IRS specifically uh, indicated that engineering firms and architectural firms will be allowed to take the pass through deduction which is similar to how they treated those organizations for purposes of the domestic production activity deduction. So it makes sense. Um, the, the one sticking point that makes everything unclear is this uh, caveat that they put in the legislation that indicates that um, if, if your business is dependent upon the reputation or skill of the business owner or its employees, then it's possible that they won't be allowed to take the deduction. Now, you know, the, the, the very, very conservative CPAs that, that will issue things on this um, have, have, have issued things like, well, that could potentially mean that no business would, would get this deduction. You know, you could have a, a baker who, who should be allowed to get the deduction, but their entire business is um, subject to the reputation and skill of its owner or employees. I don't believe that that is the way the IRS is going to go. So I, I believe that if you are an engineering firm providing engineering services um, to you know your your customers, that you will be able to take advantage of this deduction. Uh, you know, some of the CSI members I talked to at the San Francisco event said, hey, you know, everything I'm doing is engineering services, and and I'm I'm the one that's driving it. And so I'm, I'm concerned that I'm not going to get it. Or I have two lines of business. You know, I have an engineering services division and I'm producing control panels. I think it's pretty clear that the control panel um, division will qualify, but maybe the engineering services line won't qualify. And there's really a lot of gray area um, surrounding how the IRS is going to treat a business with two lines of services. But I would again state that you know, if you read the committee reports to the legislation, the intent is that the engineering services portion will still qualify, even though traditionally it would be considered a services business. Adam, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. No, that, that, that sounds about right. Okay. I, I, I do think that, well, I, I do want to add just one thing. Uh, in regard to if any company is looking at selling in the next few years, it, it's really important to go through, um, you know, the numbers on that, the what if numbers, and also if you happen to be a C corp, understand the concept of personal goodwill. So if you have individuals that are not under a, a non compete agreement or employment agreement, that that goodwill really resides with the individuals and not with the corporation. So it really gets into purchase price allocation. So we see that issue coming up and just doing some uh, tax planning. If you know that you're going to be either selling to a private equity or, or, or doing some sort of 
sale to uh, other partners or uh, key people to think through uh, some of the tax planning in advance, uh, and that will go a long way. Yeah, especially with that the new law regarding self-created property, being the sale of that being subject to ordinary income. I expect a lot of guidance will come out on that so that we understand exactly what that means, but. Um, it's certainly giving some of my clients heartburn right now that are preparing for sale in the next couple of years. Are there any that other seems questions, to be all Tony? the questions that we have. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thanks, everyone.